Good morning. I'm your moderator for today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. I welcome our speakers and guest audience to the ProShare Economist Conference, themed Nigeria's windfall tax, moving beyond concerns to governance. Our audiences today are policymakers, operators, regulators, analysts, and other individuals from different works of life. Permit me to set out a few housekeeping rules to guide the webinar. For today's agenda, I will ask our hosts to deliver opening remarks and then proceed to the all important discussions and QA session. As a measure of the citizens' polls, we will be conducting polls intermittently on this platform as we do on other social media platforms. The result of the polls on this platform will be immediate and those on X, LinkedIn, and our WhatsApp channel will be collated for public release a day after. For our esteemed participants, here is how you can engage. For all technical issues, kindly use the chat forum and direct same to the host. All attendees' microphones are muted to prevent interference. Participants have two interaction points. After the first round of exchanges with panelists and after the second round, you can submit questions via the Q&A icon. Decorum standards within our governance ethos are in place and will be activated even as we encourage everyone to express themselves. Finally, do note that this webinar is being recorded and live streamed on web TV, YouTube page, ProShare X, and Facebook platforms. By attending this webinar, you acknowledge and agree that your participation will be recorded, including any questions or comments you contribute during the session. ProShare may use the recorded content for research, educational, or future webinars. I invite our participants to engage in the first poll for our webinar. The poll is being displayed on the screen, so I encourage us to participate in the poll. Thank you very much. Please permit me to welcome the Director and Chief Economist of ProShare for his opening remarks. Um, thank you very much, Walter. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to emphasize that in times of challenges, the engagement tools for policymakers and corporate leaders are usually their deep thoughts, sequenced actions, on unshakable commitment to meeting their set deliverables. The urgency of Nigeria's fiscal situation is not to be underestimated. In the last 17 months, Nigeria has had to navigate peculiar fiscal challenges, ranging from rising domestic and foreign debt to higher local operating expenses caused by rising inflation and falling currency values. Despite these challenges, the federal government has remained unwavering in its commitment to restoring economic stability. Its efforts to contain inflation, raise public sector revenues, and redirect spending towards growth sectors are commendable. But unfortunately, they have been inadequate. The efforts have yet to yield the desired results and do not, in the main, show a clear pathway to growth and a discernible end game to prosperity. Our analysts have noted that between May 2023 and July 2024, headline inflation rose from 22.41% per annum to 33.40% per annum. The total debt situation rose from 46.25 trillion naira in the first quarter of 2023 to 121.67 trillion naira in the first quarter of 2024, a rise of 163.07%. As a result of government's efforts to harmonize exchange rates, the currency rate fell from 464.67 Naira per dollar in May 2023 in the official market, which was then called NAFEM, to 1,600 Naira per dollar in the harmonized market in August 2024, representing a decline of 70.96%. It is commendable that with several fiscal holes to fill, the government has demonstrated resourcefulness by resorting to unorthodox means of raising revenue. The latest in these measures has been the FX revaluation win for gains on tax on gains introduced to bridge part of the 2024 budget deficit. After seeing banks make large FX revaluation gains in their 2023 audited financial statements, the federal government introduced a 70% win for tax on banks' extraordinary FX earnings. The tax was not unusual but it was certainly unexpected. 
Prussia analysts in a recent report noted that windfall taxes are typically designed as win-win outcomes between consumers and producers. With producers com uh, compensating consumers for a significant spike in commodity prices or in the cost of services. Nigeria's windfall tax, however, takes money from the banks and places it with the federal treasury. In other words, Nigeria's windfall tax on FX revaluation gains has a straightforward tax base, but a somewhat unclear tax utilization. This is at the root of the ongoing trust deficits surrounding the tax. And I hope that our panelists today can help us find a fitting solution to this conundrum. American journalist Sidney J. Harris once noted, man's dilemma is not that we hate change and love it and do not love it at the same time, but we really want it. What we, but what we really want is for things to remain the same, but get better. Unfortunately, saying the same and getting better are really not clear options. The new windfall tax on FX revaluation gains is an unexpected change. The challenge now is how to use it to improve things. This is the task needed to ensure that the country's latest tax works for all. To this end, a whole of society approach to governance requires a whole of government approach to policy execution, monitoring, and control. The administration has yet to demonstrate this consciousness, thereby perpetuating a sense of administrative drift and the absence of coordination and impact in its policy execution. A windfall tax has its uses, but is no substitute for a carefully crafted tax framework. A butcher's knife has two sharp edges, but its use is more important than its design. Likewise, how a tax is assessed and used is more important than what it is called. As we allow participants to offer diverse and independent opinions, express their realities, and capture the nation's mood, we will summarize the submissions and provide a unified body of thought as a strategic advisory to the government. And on this note, I wish all participants a productive deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Teslim Shitabe, for the opening remarks. Our esteemed speakers for today's webinar are Dr. Tilewa Adebajo, CEO of the CFG Advisory, Professor Uche Waleke, Director, Institute of Capital Market Studies, Nasarawa State University, Mr. Johnson Chuku, Group Managing Director and CEO, Career Asset Management, and Mr. Kalu Ajay, Financial Analyst. Before we get to the open discussion, kindly engage in the second poll as, this, as displayed. Thank you for participating in our second poll of the webinar. Let us get down to the discourse. For the first round, I will begin with you, Dr. Tilewa Debajo. Understanding the windfall tax in Nigeria. One key principle of windfall taxes is that they are generally socioeconomic balancing acts rather than avenues for revenue mongering. Given this principle, could you expand on how this windfall tax in Nigeria is positioned within this context? Will it achieve the balance it aims for or does it lean more toward revenue generation? You have six minutes for this first round of answers. Thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, seminar for the Economist Conference. And uh, good morning to uh, my fellow participants, uh, Mr. John Chuku, Mr. Kalu Aja, Professor Uche uh, Waleke, uh, Mr. Teslim Shitabe, uh, and also uh, Mr. Femi Awoyemi, uh, founder of ProShare. Uh, it is an honor and privilege to be here with you this morning and among some distinguished uh, participants and discussants. Um, first of all, let me say that I am in support of a windfall tax, uh, considering the certain situation in the country today which we're facing. Um, the government deficit for this year is um, the, the payment, the revenue payments from uh, the budget this year for debt service is $8.2 trillion. Our education budget is $2 trillion. Our defense budget is also $2 trillion. Um, so um, our debt service payment is four times our education and defense budget. That is a significant issue in terms of sustainability. Though the government has said it has reduced uh, the debt to revenue by about 30%, uh, 
the debt profile now at 121 trillion remains a significant challenge to Nigeria. Um, having said that also, money supply has increased by 75% year on year, currently starting at 100 trillion. Uh, and we have significant issues with inflation. As you know now, the pump prices are likely to go up, uh, and that is definitely a cost push driver for inflation. Considering the fact that inflation slowed in Jan and July, we need to measure the impact of uh, the fuel price increases on uh, inflation because this is a direct impact and it's definitely going to have uh, a cost push effect on inflation. Uh, so in terms of trying to abate inflation, the challenge is, are we going to continue to raise interest rates uh, to be able to tame inflation, given the challenges we face? So clearly, the government is in a, a fiscal dilemma, and uh, no thanks to $30 trillion worth of uh, ways and means finances, of which $4.5 trillion uh, has been paid down uh, to date. So, um, but I think I need to go back to what Teslim in his opening remarks, stated, the problem we have is the trust deficit uh, and the fact that we find that, that we have a government that has put the cart before the horse in terms of policy implementation. Uh, they removed the subsidy and at the same time, they devalued the currency. So the net gain on that was zero. So we've seen a lot of inconsistencies in policy uh, implementation. The central bank governor and the finance minister did not uh, were not appointed until September, uh, and before they could settle down and get things going, uh, the naira had gone into free fall. So it wasn't until early this year that we started to stem that tide. Uh, but by then, the damage had already been done with devaluation, and with what we've seen now, NNPC has re released its results. We see an insolvent corporation that has finally admitted that it can no longer pay its traders uh, the money to import fuel. So we are in a dilemma if you take a look at it all around. But the key, uh, I go back to Teslim's opening remark, is the trust deficit. Um, and this also reflects itself with the fact that the social intervention program that was supposed to cushion the impact of this uh, economic reforms have failed in a spectacular manner. The minister in charge has been accused of corruption. She's been placed on suspension. But, you know, there's been such a long gap that, you know, there's nobody driving the social intervention program. And that, of course, has led to uh, the protests, uh, the demonstrations and the strikes, uh, which shut down the country for two days um, early in uh, August. So and the optics also is not very good at the point in time. The president is also buying a new yacht, uh, a new private jet, and also uh, a, a brand new car. So these things in terms of the optics are not just right. So the problem is that trust deficit and the inability of the government to articulate and implement its policy properly, clearly putting the cart before the horse, um, is why we're all skeptical now about this uh, windfall tax, because some people might claim is that this windfall tax is what the government is using to buy their private jets, build a mansion for the vice president, and all these sorts of things, because that is the way the, the common man would look at it on the streets. So I think uh, I agree with Teslim's uh, opening remark that while I don't have a problem with the windfall tax, the issue of his, accept of his acceptance is because of that trust deficit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tilewa Debajo, for your very insightful um, opening statements, agreeing with what has been raised by the Director and Chief Economist of Russia around opening remarks of the issue of trust deficit being breached and the need for a whole of government, whole society approach. And that's very, very critical at this time. Thank you once again. And I'll get on to Professor Uche Waleke, Director of the Institute of Capital Market Studies, National State University, and also a member of the Presidential Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms Committee. We're looking at the insights into global windfall tax practices and yeah. strategies for optimizing tax benefits. So I want to ask for your first round of uh, questions. Globally, windfall taxes have been implemented with arguably varying degrees of success. 
what best practices can we adopt to optimize the benefits of the windfall tax while minimizing potential drawbacks? How do these global practices compare to Nigeria's approach? You have uh, six minutes for your first response. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you so much, um, moderator. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, my, my fellow discussants. Let me also say that it is my pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation on the windfall levy. I choose to call it windfall levy. Uh, that's also the preference um, of uh, um, the uh, lawmakers when they were passing the the bill. You know, not the... I think we'll get back to Prof. I think he's uh, trying to check up the connections again. But we'll get back to Prof when he comes back on board. So we'll move on to quickly the next uh, discussant on our webinar. Mr. Johnson Chuku, rightly, the group CEO of Kauri Asset Management Limited. We're looking at bridging the trust deficit and establishing guardrails for policies as highlighted in the opening remarks. In the current economic climate, there is a significant trust deficit between the government and the public regarding policy reversals and some policies like the windfall tax, which of course we've been told the, by National Assembly parlance is a windfall levy. What should be done to bridge this trust gap and ensure that policies are transparent, fair, and consistently applied? How can we establish long-term guardrails to prevent policy reversals and build trust among economic agents? You have six minutes for your first opening response. Thank you, Atabase, for um, this uh, program. Let me also salute my colleagues, fellow panelists, uh, Professor Walek, Dr. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, I have Dr. Tilewade Adebadon and yes. um, uh, the founder of Post here, uh, my good friend. Um, so uh, back to the question because I have <laughs> I have six minutes. I've almost <laughs> spent one minute um, saluting my fellow panelists. Let's even look at what is the trust deficit. Let's start from the academic definition of trust deficit. It's basically when uh, commitments are not aligned with the outcome of Commitments are not abided with. Uh, when government make commitments or make statements, uh, and then the uh, outcome or the actions of the government do not align perfectly with the promises they've made. That's why you talk of trust of deficit, because basically people are saying, look, what you have promised us, you are not able to keep. So let's look at why do we have this trust deficit? And we're going to just, because if you want to go back to the issue of trust deficit around the country, around the, about this country, you're going to go back to the beginning of um, uh, Sevilla uh, in the, from the point of independence. But let's dwell on the current government where we can change the thing because you can't change anything about the past. In the first place, the government came about and said, look, we are no longer going to borrow by ways and means. The government made out this commitment and said, we're not going to borrow by ways and means. So I want to highlight those issues of fraud deficit and then we deal, we deal with how do we build the guardrails. And the government, in the first five months of the government, by the time the government came into power, the uh, the the um, body from the federal from the central bank and ways and means uh, was twenty two trillion. Uh, then the government paid two point seven trillion. The government by December last year went to um, to the national assembly to secretize another seven point three trillion, uh, bringing it down to bringing it to thirty trillion. So in effect, within a period of five months, the government borrowed seven point three trillion. If you look at the announcement that was, uh, the details of the budget that were made by the Minister of Budget, the, it showed that at the end of September, 30th of September, federal government borrowing by ways and means was about uh, three, trillion, uh, 3 trillion. So in effect, the next um, three months or two months, uh, that is October, November, and December, next three months, the government borrowed another, another 4 trillion. So in effect, that, if you had make, made a judgment on the basis that the government is not going to go into ways and means funding, seven trillion was borrowed in a single in a period of five five months. Fast forward, at the end of um, last month, uh, end of um, uh, August, the government had borrowed by from the financial system by way of issuance of treasury bills, issuance of federal government bond, federal savings bond. The government has borrowed. 
21.8 trillion naira. This obviously not in the public space because you have to add that to the national debt about 121 trillion at the end of uh, March last year, this year. So in effect, the government had a com commitment on its fiscal responsibilities not given to that. Next commitment we have had in the financial space is issue of the government said we're not going to we're going to reduce the number of taxes in the system and harmonize the taxes. At the same time, the government is introducing more taxes. So for business leaders, you ask yourself, so what should I believe? And that's why I talk about trust deficit. If I if I'm allowed, I can go on and on and on, including the issue of subsidy is gone. And several uh, agents of government say there's no subsidy. And at the same time, we're discussing about seven, six trillion, six billion dollars that had a accumulated as debt because of subsidy. So, but back to the issue, how do we build guardrails? We need to go back and make sure that some of our laws are adhered to the letters. And when those laws are breached, they are sanctions. Take for instance the issue of fiscal responsibility act. It had made provision the government must follow maximum of 5% of previous year's uh, government revenue, and they must be paid back within one year. That was breached consistently. That's how accumulating two trillion naira in deficit in uh, in uh, ways and means funding. There is no sanction ever imposed on anybody. So now the government at the same time that said it's not it's going to it's not going to borrow from uh, the ways and means. It's also expanding the limits on ways and means borrowing to ten percent. So that's inconsistency. So the key thing that we have to look at what are the what's the fiscal responsibility act? Can we make sure that is enforced and government does not breach it. It don't just breach the law and just go on as if nothing has happened. Then we must also make sure that where those breaches are going to ever happen, it goes through a process of amendment of the law. That would, and that law is subject to public uh, public uh, opinion so that people can actually say, suppose to the people and people can say, look, you shouldn't do this or you should do, do this. Probably by the time we ensure that policies and laws are abided by those in public service and breaches are sanctioned, we may get to a point where uh, actions of government would align with commitment made by government, and that will narrow the trust deficit we have in the country. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson Chuku. You clearly stated it, that for us to have a society where there's that trust deficit being breached, there has to be clear laws that are ahead to, and also if they have been breached, like the Fiscal Responsibility Act you raised, there has to be sanctions. Thank you, and we will get back to you again in the second round of uh, questions. But let's get back to Professor Uche Waleke. Um, I believe now you're on, and of course, the conversation is around the insights into the global windfall tax practices and strategies for optimizing tax benefits. Uh, globally, windfall taxes have been implemented with arguably varying degrees of success. What best practices can we adopt to optimize the benefits of the windfall tax while minimizing potential drawbacks? How do these global practices compare to Nigeria's approach? Prof, I yield the floor to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope you, you can hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, sorry, it's my network. Um, I had uh, greeted my... Uh, this fellow discussants about I, I had also greeted um, you know the participants. Um, I started by saying that um, the views I'm expressing here are my personal views and not the views of the uh, the, the presidential committee on fiscal policy, uh, because to the best of my knowledge, the uh, windfall levy did not emanate from that um, recommendations of that um, committee. Uh, let me also say that the. Um, the goal of streamlining taxes and um, you know removing multiplicity of taxes um, is still is still um, being pursued. Um, the the work has not been concluded in that direction, uh, and I'm pretty sure as soon as that is concluded, um, that will also be out to, to the public. The ideal idea is to reduce the over 60 different types of taxes you know reduce them to as you know not more than nine so that is what the committee is working on and, and that uh, process um you know is still in place uh let me also say up front that i support the idea of the windfall levy uh, i want you to know that i have been calling it levy not tax uh, and that's because of um its peculiar nature is uh, one of um, and it's not meant to 
you know, be a reoccurring uh, thing. Um, so I, I support it on the ground that it is not new to Nigeria, just as you rightly mentioned, it's a um, uh, levy that we've also seen in so many other parts of the world. Uh, in the US, in the UK, for example, as far back as 1981, Margaret Thatcher introduced the um, windfall levy on, um, uh, you know, for energy companies. And even recently, uh, we have seen um, the, uh, you know, Rishi Sunak uh, introduce windfall uh, taxes um, at 25 percent, which has just been increased to 35 percent now in the UK. The, in Spain, we've also had uh, instances of windfall tax, particularly on banks, uh, but the rate over there is uh, as low as 4.8%. Uh, we, we've also seen windfall uh, taxes in other countries, uh, Hungary, um, you know, Slovakia, and Italy. Italy is one good example where it has succeeded. Uh, in Italy, uh, we, we have windfall tax on banks. Um, it used to be 10%. From 10%, it moved up to uh, 25%. Uh, today, the windfall tax, as, as at August last year, it increased it to 45%, uh, <clears throat> the windfall tax on banks. Um, in the entire e e Europe, the European Union, um, the European Commission uh, also in, you know, introduced windfall levy of about 33% for the entire you know, uh, zone. So the point I'm making is that it's a global thing. And it's usually um, as a result of um, uh, sometimes actions or inactions of government or global developments. In the in the in Europe, for example, the Russian Ukraine Ukraine war uh, resulted in a lot of you know supply chain uh, you know um, bottlenecks, high inflation rates in 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 the eurozone. So central banks in Europe responded by increasing rates, and because of the Increase in rates by central banks in Europe. A lot, a number of financial institutions in in Europe, you know, started them um, declaring, uh, uh, you know, huge extraordinary profits, which the government, um, you know, decided to to target. Um, the windfall taxes traditionally have been usually on energy companies, um, electricity companies, you know, oil and gas companies. But in recent time, we've also been we're, we're beginning to see them on banks, in particular, financial institutions, but. Let me also say part of why I'm saying this is levy. In the case of Nigeria, the windfall levy is not because banks' uh, interest rates are up and banks are making you know profits from the you know interest income. The windfall levy is as a result of exchange rate unification, the an action of the government, which now resulted in naira devaluation and which now also uh, put uh, a number of banks in a position to make a um, super you know profit. Now, by definition, we, you can say that windfall levy is any levy on the gain of a firm, okay, that is not as a result of the sweat of that firm, okay, that's a, as a result of the efforts of that enterprise. So it's largely on what is called, um, uh, if you like, for tweet, for tweet or gain or on lock. So where you have that kind of situation, or where a government policy has resulted in uh, you know, winners and losers, uh, you know, in, in an economy, uh, the windfall levy is usually used to redistribute wealth, okay, to get some from the people that benefited from it and to see how um, it can be used to, uh, you know, uh, mitigate the impact, adverse impact is having on the others. That's essentially what it is. And that's why I want to see this windfall levy. I don't want to see it from the perspective of increasing government revenue. I, I can I notice that that is one of the objectives, but that sh that shouldn't be. The major objective should be to use it to cushion, you know, the adverse impact it's having on vulnerable individuals and vulnerable uh, businesses. The adverse impact on of uh, naira devaluation. So it, it shouldn't be from the point of increasing gov government, um, you know, re revenue. So. Again, I support it, um, uh, uh, but I am not in support of the rate. The rate is um, unusually high. Now, if you look at windfall levies across the globe, it ranges from 4.8%, especially for banks, 4.8% in the case of Spain to 40% uh, in the case of uh, Italy. Well, that's the range you know, I, I was able to uh, uh, see. So I didn't see any country with as high as 70% windfall levy 
or for financial institutions. You can see 70% for energy companies. For example, in um, Slovakia, it is 70% for energy companies. In um, Ireland, it is 75%, you know, but for banks in particular, you are not likely to see a rate that's as high as 70%, which is why I think, I, I would suggest that the uh, part of what should be done going forward should be to look at the rate again, you know, to, to explore the possibility of reducing it to not more than 50%. I also think the uh, there are no clear guidelines on the implementation and which, which should happen. If you look at the case of Europe, usually they come up with clear guidelines. The European Commission had very clear guidelines on the implementation. Now the act has a number of you know ambiguities um, uh, in it, which will require you know some clarification. For example, the banks are, are, you know have asked the question: Now, will this seventy percent levy be on their total uh, you know profit, since having paid thirty percent profit on the on their uh, you know gains previously, or will it be on part? So there are ambiguities that need to be resolved, and that's why a clear guideline is required. I also fault the the fact that it, it, did, it, it didn't emanate from wide consultation, you know, with key, key stakeholders. Uh, there should have been consultation before, you know, agreeing on the rates. Um, Thank you, Paul. On the issue Thank of... You, um, okay, okay, maybe let me hold yes, my thoughts. Let me hold my yes. breath for now. Until yes, I'll give up to you. Thank you. You've, you've, yeah. you've uh, highlighted very key issues there. You said that uh, it shouldn't be a source of revenue, but rather it should be used to cushion the effects of uh, the challenges of the vulnerable Nigerians. You've also talked about the rates that, I mean, comparative to places like Italy, it doesn't exceed 40%, so 70% is, is too high. And you also talked about the ambiguities that need to be addressed and most importantly, uh, the fact that this whole process needs guidelines on clear win-win uh, situation with the banks. Thank you very much, Prof. We'll get back to you on your very insightful perspectives. Now we'll get to Mr. Kalu Aja, a financial analyst. And Mr. Kalu, we're looking at reinforcing fiscal reform initiative and investment flows. We need investments in the country. Leaning on your experience and expertise as a financial analyst, how do you see the federal government tax reforms fitting with the windfall uh, tax? And how will it affect investment and households, particularly in the financial services sector? What should investors and households be doing uh, at this time? We yield the floor to you for right. six minutes for your first response. Uh, thank you so much for the invite. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you to the federal panelists. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's get right to it. Uh, we have a committee headed by Mr. Taiwo. Um, essentially, what's going on is that the government wants to streamline, uh, make taxes simple, right? That's the simple way to put it. They want to make taxes simple, make collections simple, and also to increase the tax revenues that the federal government of Nigeria earns. The problem is it's taking just too long uh, to get the committee to bring out a proposal to Nigerians. Hence, in this vacuum, we see um, lots of press releases. There's going to be a 10% hike in VAT. Uh, there's going to be less taxes, but we're not yet sure what is going to come out of that committee. So it's difficult to then say if we support it or how that's going to pan out into this windfall taxes. So the first thing is that speed you know, it's of the essence when you bring out a tax policy for a country like Nigeria going through change. But let's briefly touch on the windfall taxes. I think the key word there is optics. Optics. Uh, this is like a PT, a petroleum trust fund kind of situation where we have uh, profits that are levied and are going to then be used uh, or spent by the government to provide service for the Nigerian population. Like everyone has said, Nigerians simply do not trust the federal government of Nigeria and the states to spend this levy. And I think that's basically why you see a bit of back and forth. It's going to be about nearly four trillion that's going to be raised from this levy. No one you would ask in Nigeria would trust that if you give this funds to the states or to the federal government, that it will get to the guy on the street to cushion the effect of the revolution of the Naira. It's just that's the problem. No one trusts the government to do what they say they're going to do with this. If they had come out with this windfall tax and said it's going to go to a fund, and this fund may perhaps go to SMEs, or the banks can keep the funds, the, the money, but create a special a, a small and middle scale enterprises fund, which would lend to only SMEs that get less than $5 million in revenues, and that would be a five-year term. You know, something like, like a subsidy on loans, but the banks would disperse it. 
that might have you no know, give it a bit of you know buy in because now the banks will disperse those funds, but it's going to be separated from their uh, from their usual deposits, but it's still going to be in the bank's balance sheet. So you're strengthening the banks, you are increasing lending, and you're bringing this PPP type format into the whole idea of the levy. So there'll, there'll be a bit of a buying with the private sector and of course with the government, and of course people can track and hold these banks to account. So on that note, let's just move on again to the how it ties in to the general um, capital raising. So let me speak on behalf of the investors out there. The CBN has asked the banks to raise funds through capital raising, and the banks have all responded. We see public offers, rights issues all around now. Then suddenly you bring out the windfall tax. So as an investor, what am I looking at? I want to buy this bank shares, but I'm hearing the bank's bill taxed 70%. I'm not sure what that means, but the bank is going to be taxed 70%. So what comes to me as an investor? If I put in a Naira there, does it mean my, 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 my returns, my dividends are going to be taxed? It's not clear. The government has not explained what the windfall tax or windfall levy is and how it's going to affect my investments in the banking sector. So you've seen in the prices, the share prices of all those banks came down. And these banks are raising capital from local and from foreign investors. So it's like a own goal where you're trying to risk. Remember, the banks has told the CBN has told the banks to ring fence, to ring fence these uh, profits. Don't put it as part of your dividends. So now you tell the bank that that profit is going to be taxed 70%. So what is what's the signal you're sending out to the investors? That the Nigerian government can retroactively go after your profit if you make a return on our bad policies. It's not by luck that the banks make the profit. They took positions in treasury, which is their core functions. Banks trade on currencies. If you make a bad policy, banks will make money off that, as in other institutions that are not banks. So you can actually go after our profit to apply the better to your policy. So it's a bad signal for investors globally that you should stay off the capital market for now until the windfall levy or tax takes place then you can see what's happening. So it would affect the banks raising capital and it will affect the goal of having this $1 trillion economy. So in terms of speed, in terms of optics, in terms of general plan to say, let's use the windfall tactics to boost capital base of banks and also to boost the consumption of Nigerians, we haven't done that. Nigerians are really, really suffering and they need to get clear guidelines. The government seems focused on IGR, raising funds, and not physically deploying the funds. Till now, we don't have any CNG buses out there till today as we speak. We don't have them yet. So how will this three trillion, if it is levied or taxed, going to affect the cost of transportation today? I think that's the problem. The government has not shown competence in managing public funds. So it's very, very hard to then say, um, we're gonna trust them with three trillion. I like it. I think it's good to distribute the income. The banks have made too much money bring some fit down and distribute it. But how, what speed, who is managing that whole process? These are the questions that the federal government is going to have to deal with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaula Aja. Always, always giving us those uh, very unique perspectives. You've said it clearly. There needs to be speed in the activities of the Presidential Fiscal and Tax Reforms Committee. There's also the need to be very clear in terms of the optics. How is this fund going to be used? like you mentioned, the Petroleum Trust Fund. So what's going to be used with the fund to address the challenges of Nigerians? And also you talked about the signals for investors. And that's something that needs to be very uh, clearly addressed by the policymakers and regulators, because if a sector that contributes to the economy and drives even activities in the financial market goes through this whole situation and it's not very clear, the end game, it becomes a challenge. But thank you very much, Mr. Kalaja. We'll get back to you in the second round of uh, questions. But let's get to you, Dr. Tilewa, the Bajo in our second round now, and we're looking at the consensus. This is very important. The first round of responses from our discussants have talked about the issue of bridging uh, the trust deficit, clarity in policy, but in all consensus to move our uh, country forward. So in looking at establishing a consensus from the different perspectives on the windfall tax to our advantage, can you help us parallel and identify differences in the fundamental understanding of and interpretations around the windfall levies? Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay, great. Um, well, I think um, 
the other discussants have um, hit the points. And I think uh, what struck me, I think, was this issue of maybe using the windfall tax and putting it into a dedicated fund whereby we can see some transparency in the disbursements or allocating particular points of this to there, maybe putting some of this money into the student loan fund or there's now a credit, uh, consumer credit corporation, uh, things like that. So that maybe significant portion of these funds are going maybe towards student loans, maybe towards the uh, credit, putting some of these funds directly into buying equipment for the teaching hospitals around the country i.e. diverting these funds into social infrastructure where we can make an impact. Um, I think the uh, the other participants have, uh, the other discussants have captured that. And I think really it's how we reverse this in social infrastructure. I think that is critical where we can make more of an impact. And of course, some of this money should also go towards the social intervention fund that will cushion the effects. I think I buy that idea significantly. I think trying to keep that money within the banks would not, people would not also not trust that because people also don't trust Nigerian banks. But I think I agree with the point that we need to isolate those funds and we need to reinvest them in social infrastructure without a doubt. Um, but going forward, I think what is important is that the fundamentals of the Nigerian economy is what we all really need to talk about. Um, our gross domestic product has been eroded from close to uh, 560 in 2014, closing on 600 billion. We're going to close this year at about 240 billion in terms of our GDP. So by the time you take a look at eroding about three, two to 300 billion dollars of your GDP, that's pretty significant. Nigeria is now the fourth largest economy in Africa and the challenges are significant. Um, we all remember that in 2008, 2009, um, despite the fact that we had a global financial crisis, Nigeria had in excess of $20 billion in excess food accounts. Um, two governors came up, notably Fashola and the Amici, and said that that money had to be shared to the states, and um, they went to court. And in, you know, the idea then was to turn the excess crude into the sovereign wealth fund. Now you have a sovereign wealth fund that has what you call a stabilization fund, but that stabilization fund is less than a hundred, you know, million dollars, which cannot impact the uh, the current situation of fiscal challenges we have in Nigeria. On the other hand, Norway's uh, sovereign wealth fund is about one point two trillion dollars, and declared a profit profit of over two hundred and thirty billion dollars just last year. So the fact is that we have not put in a mechanism in place to be able to adjust for fiscal deficit. Who will think that we'll be suffering in Nigeria when oil is at $80 a barrel? Normally, the problems of Nigeria is when oil prices drop to maybe $40 a barrel or $30 a barrel. Oil production has gone down to $1.3 trillion. Government does not have revenues. Now they're taxing non-oil revenues. Uh, oil production is at 1.3 trillion barrels. In in 1977, oil production was 2.5 million barrels a day. Today, we have no business where the oil should not be at least 3.5 million barrels a day. So investment in the oil sector in 2019 was $22 billion. Today is less than $2 billion. And we've all seen the balance sheet of the NNPC, um, $264 trillion in assets. 30 billion uh, barrels of oil in reserves and 200 trillion uh, scoff, uh, uh, cubic feet of gas reserves. And we cannot exploit it to the benefit of Nigeria. So those challenges, structural challenges remain. And I think coupled with the fact that this government has not got their reform project on track, you know, we we're going to continue to experience significant challenges within the next 18 months in this country. Unfortunately, yeah. Thank you, Doctor Tilewa. I mean, you you the last part of it is that the structural reforms need to really be on course, and that is a very significant issue for the economy. We need that on course at this time. But it's good to know that you also look at the uh, thought of a fund which can be leveraged to uh, 
impact the current situations with the households and also the fact that we need to get back to ramping up crude oil production and boost our revenue. But let's get to Professor Waleke. How can the global standards and the principles around windfall taxes be tailored to fit Nigeria's unique economic environment? And how can the whole of government and whole of society approach be effectively implemented to ensure that the tax policies like the windfall tax serve as productivity incentives? Okay, thank you once again. Uh, well, before, before I address that question, let me uh, say that um, I appreciate the uh, recommendations, uh, you know, being made here um, and the concerns around the work of the uh, Presidential Committee on Tax um, Reforms and Fiscal Policy. Uh, with respect to speed, uh, part of why the committee, you know, has yet to conclude this assignment has to do with the fact that um, it's not just about the federal government, um, the policies uh, to do with the federal government, it also involves that of subnationals. So the streamlining of taxes that uh, is being done also uh, accommodates that of um, the states and local governments. Um, so at the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, it is, in, it is, the, it is the intention uh, of the committee to recommend um, different types of classes, you know, types of taxes that you know are not more than um, uh, nine, you know, single digits. Um, let me also say on the issue of um, uh, global standards or global practices, uh, what is clear when you look at um, what has happened in other jurisdictions is um, on the utilization, utilization of the windfall levy. They are, it's usually specific. Uh, it's not uh, more like a part of a you know, general budgetary uh, provision. You want to use it to, uh, you know, plug budget deficit. That's not the intention. It's usually specific. And that is the, the what I, I will also want us to you know, adopt here. And um, this general, this um, attitude of um, having general ob objectives you know, to uh, um, sources of fund, uh, public sector sources of fund has also not helped the, you know, the trust uh, deficit issue. If you look at even the recent bond we raised, the recent uh, domestic dollar bond that was issued, $500 million bond. Yes, uh, we know the size of the bond. We know the um, the tenor as five years. We also know the coupon, 9.7. Uh, we know the minimum investment, you know, $10,000, increment of $1,000. But that's all about it. Nobody told us about, I didn't mm -hmm. read about the purpose of the, uh, you know, Domestic dollar bond, what is going to be used to used for, or the, what projects that that bond will be will be tied, and that has um, is something that has uh, lingered, uh, you know, more like a legacy thing. If you look at our debt uh, stock today, uh, if you look at the instruments for raising domestic debt, for example, let me use that as an example. Now you will find that FGM bonds dominate. FGM bonds account for more than seventy percent of uh, the you know bonds we have raised. Uh, from the domestic market, and uh, FGM bonds are us usually have a discretionary feature. They are not particularly tied to projects. If you look at the the project tied uh, instruments, you know, in that uh, structure, is is just less than three percent. Talking about the Sukuk, Sukuk of uh, one trillion, you have a domestic debt stock of uh, maybe over sixty trillion. Sukuk is just one 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 trillion, and then you have um, green bonds of around fifteen, uh, uh, you know, billion. So the infrastructure uh, uh, type is just very insignificant, less than 3%. And when you borrow and you know they are not tied to specific purposes, okay, that's where this trust deficit thing, um, you know, are, is also one of the things that you know gives rise to trust, trust deficit because people cannot really point to what the uh, loans have been used for. The same thing can also be said for external debts where we have relied more on euro bonds. Again, euro bonds have discretionary features. When you take euro bonds, nobody says you must use that for a particular purpose. These are the things that give rise to trust, uh, uh, you know, issues and trust deficit, which is why I want to strongly re recommend that any money we are raising, again, given our huge debt burden, huge debt service to revenue ratio, 
any money we are raising must be tied to specific um, projects. So this one windfall levy that the government wants to get, 3. Uh, around 3.5 uh, you know, uh, trillion naira, that's the estimate. Okay, it should also be tied to a particular project that should go to um, assisting vulnerable individuals and uh, small companies. And the good news is that at the level of our committee, uh, fiscal uh, uh, committee, uh, we're also not just only recommending, uh, making recommendations with respect to taxes, uh, revenues, but we're also making recommendations with respect to spending because it's about fiscal policy. Fiscal policy encompasses not just revenues, but also spending and uh, public debt. So our recommendations are going are comprehensive, and I'm sure by the time they are out and the government begins to implement them, um, you know, for me, it's going to be a, a game changer. Now, again, um, talking about global standards, I've talked about specific specific purpose, um, uh, and um, I had also mentioned that in terms of standards, what usually happens is that the rates are phased. Okay, they usually start from a low rate. And that's the trend. You find most countries, they start from a low rate and then, you know, uh, graduate them, you know, as time goes on. But in our own case, we just started, you know, from a very high rate of 70%. Um, uh, so that's also why I think uh, we should take a second look, you know, at the rates. And um, of course, after engaging in a, uh, you know, stakeholder, uh, you know, uh, meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, for that. I mean, it's very clear that we're seeing that um, consonance in terms of what um, Mr. Kalaja raised, the need for a, a dedicated fund. Dr. Tilewa goes with that, and it must be something that's transparent. And of course, Prof, you've raised the need for project-tied um, funds, like this kind of monies realized from the tax should be tied to specific projects, education, healthcare, areas that really impacts um, Nigerians. Thank you very much for your perspective. Now to Mr. Johnson Chuku. Considering the fiscal implications of budget 2024 adjustments with the inclusion of the windfall tax, how can the government align this policy with broader economic objectives without stifling economic growth? What lessons can be drawn? Of course, we've talked about the actions so far from the Presidential Committee on Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms. Mr. Kalaja has raised the issue of speed and, and optics. So what is your own perspective? Okay, um, I will start by saying that uh, one of the things that is missing in terms of uh, even fiscal policies and effectiveness in terms of economic development is that we seem to be treating fiscal policies in silos. We have what we call medium-term expenditure framework, which is supposed to be a three-year loan plan that's supposed to give us a three-year plan for an economic, our economic plan. But unfortunately, it's actually an annual ritual where Basically, what the government does every year, they do a completely new medium-term expenditure framework. There's actually no role in, in terms of uh, medium-term uh, expenditure framework. So we don't have, as a country, we don't seem to have an overarching economic policy where the fiscal policy fits into the overall uh, economic development policy. And that's, for me, is the starting point in terms of how does this tax fit into that. In the first place, if you take, take this issue of tax, uh, or whether you call it uh, uh, levy or tax, that is windfall tax or windfall levy. The first question I, I wanted to ask uh, those, of course, upon there's no um, public sector person who is here to answer that question exists. In deciding, in deciding to have the windfall tax, did we also look at what is the impact of that tax on the overall economic development of the country? If you want to look at that, which means you are going to have a, a bad view of economic policies before you enunciate them, instead of having a tunnel view of the impact of economic policy on a very narrow perspective. So obviously the government is looking at, let's increase our revenue. But they also recognize that at the time when you this tax evolved or this income evolved, this windfall income came to the banks, they also, and that segment of the economy that suffered huge losses as a result of moving the exchange rates. Because what has happened that if a bank lends to um, somebody in, in, in dollar, the person will have a liability in dollar, the corporate Nigerian operator will have a liability in dollar, which has to be revalued at the new Asian date. While the bank will have an asset in dollar that has to be revalued in, 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 at the new Asian date. So if you look at the holistic or, or consolidated balance sheet of corporate Nigeria, you're going to see that whatever gain that was made in terms of um, windfall gain has also been offset by losses in terms of windfall 
uh, 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 exchange losses. So if you sum up the two, you may end up with a zero benefit. So if you impose a tax on those who have gotten reward, and that tax is not passed on as a benefit or to offset the cost that others have incurred in the as a result of this movement in exchange rate, you are going to find out that corporate Nigeria suffers. You are seeing a lot of corporate Nigerian operators that have declared negative share of that fund. Nestle, for instance, is declared negative share of that fund. Some of the companies sit in this country because of the unusual movement we witnessed in the exchange rate. So if government had had a holistic view of how do we grow this economy and not just how do we make money from uh, what we are seeing as, a as a revenue, then the government would have said, if we have to impose this tax, then the benefit of the tax would have been passed on to corporate Nigeria that had incurred huge losses. Like I said, if you take a balance sheet of a corporate, corporate Nigeria, you're not going to end up with a zero because the banks are holding assets because of loans they granted in dollars. The corporate Nigeria have, are holding liabilities in corp for the uh, loans they took in, in dollars and their liabilities have gone up while the asset value had gone up. And then you're only looking at asset and taxing it without tax, uh, thinking of how to deal with the other one. I mean the liabilities. So it, in summary, what I'm saying is that for us to have effective use of physical policies, including tax policy, which is a component of physical policy, we really need to define what's our overall economic development plan. And that also touches on to what I'm, so what my, so some of the things my colleagues have said, that we need to use this to support the vulnerable in the society. The vulnerable are those who, obviously, because of moving exchange, they cannot feed and stuff like that suffering severe uh, standard, uh, cost of living crisis. There is no component of this tax that's going into them. So in effect, the government is just looking at what's the need for us as a government. And that defeats economic growth, that defeats economic development, because you don't, you don't take revenues from a system and then not look at the implications of that revenue uh, that you've taken to the other aspect of the system. And I think we need to for a country of our state, state of development. And I want to emphasize this before I round up. If you look at, and I need to use this word, tax policy is a domestic economic policy. You don't ever copy what happens elsewhere because economic conditions differ from one uh, jurisdiction to another jurisdiction. Give it, let's take for instance, a country like United Arab Emirates. United Arab Emirates, the cost of developing and attracting capital into their country, suspended the charging of value added tax for years had a zero tax policy, corporate tax policy for years, had a zero personal income tax policy for years. And that encouraged the most skilled people to go to United Arab Emirates, encouraged capital to flow into that economy. And when they have built a base, a huge base upon which to impose tax, they impose those taxes. In imposing taxes, our country must define how do we grow the economy. Tax is supposed to be a physical tool to stimulate economic growth, economic development, stimulate consumption, and discourage what is not good for the system or the, for the economy or the, for the people. And that's why you also have neg negative tax, which is why you have subsidy, where you use a tax policy to support a sector of the economy to grow. If we don't have a holistic economic development plan, we're going to use uh, tax policies in silos. And as we try to generate benefit for one sector, the implication of losses or costs on other sectors may be actually more severe the benefit we're trying to gain. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson Chuku. Very clear that we must um, not continue with tweeting fiscal uh, policies in silos. We need an overarching economic policy that drives growth and development and has a long-term view. And of course, you also agree with what Roshi has raised earlier, a whole of government approach is very critical at this time. And you raised something very fundamental about corporate Nigeria. We must consider what corporate Nigeria is going through. Policies must understand that private sector plays a key role in it and that's where we need our win-win situation. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson Chuku, for those clear insights. Now I'll get to you, Mr. Kaulaja. You, you raised the issue around investors signaling what they think at this time. And I, I just want to gain from you. You've heard what uh, Mr. Johnson Chuku has said about the gains and pains and losses. Um, how should investors in the banking sector consider this uh, windfall tax? You know, you said it's going to be challenging for them. They need clarity, uh, but I don't get your perspective on this. Yeah, thanks again. Um, so the market has already spoken. The market has said uh, because of the uncertainty, the prices came down. So if you look at the banking sector, the prices have come down because uh, investors are asking questions and they're not getting answers. And this is in line with the capital raise. It's a capital raise 
and there's uncertainty. So you see a bit of the, the like the retail price on the floor of the exchange is now at par with the public offer. And usually the public offers as a discount. But now sometimes them at par or just a few uh, nairas um, it, it, different. So you can see the market react already to the news and it's just in the banking sector. So it's a pain to investors just because we're not clear on what's going on. I mean, on this panel here, we understand what's happening, but to the average Nigerian investor, it's not very, very clear what the windfall tax or levy is. We hear the trillions, but we don't know what really that means to us. And that's where you see the prices then react. So it's a, it's a, it's a pain. You know, if you, do, if you don't get um, clarity, it's a pain. Now, then we'll move over to meeting investors' feel and to what Mr. Chuku has said. Corporate Nigeria is also going to feel the pitch, right? Lots of negative capital out there, and the funds are leaving the sector. So we're taking these funds out of the sector. If you go back to the point I made, if we allow the bank to keep these funds as part of their capital, right, but to ring fence the funds, put in a special you know, pool or fund or whatsoever, and then if the banks are able to make, should we say, reports on this. You can appoint independent directors to that specific fund and you target SMEs or you target consumer loans so that, that people can see a billion went here, a billion went there. That money is still in the system. That was the purpose of taxes for the people. You know, so why take it out of the system? Which means the government looking at it as a revenue grab. And it goes back to the optics and the way government has operated. You take your mind back to MTN. We find them, yes, but we find them huge fines. Same with this one, 70% as well. So the, 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 the narrative is that the government is looking for funds wherever it can find funds. And this provides the government a natural excuse to go after the profits of one of the largest, you should say, contributors to corporate profits in Nigeria. If you look at back now to the investor, what should the investor do? Number one, number two, if you look at the returns, the dividend yield in Nigeria, the largest players are going to be the banks. The, 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 the highest paying dividend yield company in Nigeria, I believe is UBA, the banking, Lexus Access, banking before we get to real estate. So you are still in a good place if you still invest in that sector, irrespective of the noise. I mean, um, in terms of real returns, the capital market, i.e. the stock market, has given you nearly, nearly real rates of return in Nigeria today when you compare to inflation. So still being in that sector is still a good thing if you want to keep your money for longer term and you can absorb the risk. So this is noise, and I think the banks look at their, their Q2, I mean, their half year and Q2 returns. Have, I'm still seeing billions posted. I've seen two big banks come out after this windfall tax, posting billions in profit after tax. So I hope there won't be a levy on excess profits uh, not created by, uh, by a foreign exchange valuation, but still it's a good sector uh, to be in. Overall, and just to emphasize the point again, just to emphasize the point again, what we're really debating, right, is this trust deficit. I want to go back to it again. That's really what we're debating. And I think the, the, the takeaway from this to everyone listening is that the government has got to realize that there's no trust. People do not trust the government to manage money. And it's got to address that trust. This three trillion will go to the budget and it's going to go to salaries. And I think we all know it. And that's where it's going to end. There will be no feedback. There will be no uh, tracking how this has, what has happened to these funds. And then tomorrow they come back and they're going to tag maybe oil companies next time. Maybe they'll go after excess profits on diesel. Maybe if Dan Gota Refinery is now up and running, we might say, okay, let's make tax excess PMS profit that Dan Gota has made. And the same story is going to go to social investment and we don't see any returns. So there's got to be a bit of a framework and there has to be clarity, that which is the whole idea. The economy needs certainty. It needs rules to be followed so that we know how to invest and we know how our government is thinking about spending the commonwealth of Nigerians. Right now, it's just a bit of tax, IGR spend, and the citizens are not seeing anything. Lots of, you know, <laughs> big numbers thrown around. But if you go back to it, the minimum wage as of today, as of today, is still the 18. The 70 hasn't come in, but we're doing a windfall tax. So it's not adding up somewhere. And we've got to pass that message back to the government. You've got to move faster, faster, and do things that are seen. It can't be esoteric words. It's got to be seen and held in the hand of the people. And then that way, people have to build back that trust uh, the people had in the government. I uh, yield for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalaja. Very, very clear insights from our discussions today. I mean, it's really showing that we are 
despite the challenges we are seeing, there's a pathway that we must adopt. And it's very critical that the trust deficit is bridged. Uh, it's very important at this time for government to build trust from citizens. And one way that critical uh, step can be taken is to be transparent in how the proceeds from this tax will be utilized. Also, the need for some of the parents have talked about a dedicated fund maybe could be used and channels to projects that can have impact on the uh, citizens. Policy clarity, I know some of our panelists have talked about it, is very important. And also from a member of the Presidential uh, Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms Committee, it's been raised that it's very important that even at the state level, everything is harnessed so that there'll be speed in implementation. Also, there's a need for corporate Nigeria to be considered in policies because they are part of the drivers of our economy and issue of the rates of this uh, windfall tax on banks. 70% uh, is too huge and at this time, a major pain for the sector. But I want to thank our, our discussants. We're going to go to uh, a poll and then of course, we'll engage in a Q&A session. But I just want to thank our panelists for their perspectives. We also want to hear from our participants. So let's participate in our third poll. And then of course, we would get some of the comments or questions from our participants. Thank you very much, our participants, for engaging in our third poll. Now, let's get on to our Q&A session. We'll get comments and questions from our participants. We have the first one uh, from Tunde Pampam. Pam. He says, what is, the assess what is the accessible period of this levy? And is this levy on both realized and unrealized FX gains? So I'd like to take, I'd like Mr. Johnson Chuka and Professor Uche Waleke to take uh, this question. Okay, so, thank you very much. Um, the accessible period is two years in line with um, global standards. Um, it's two years, so 2023 to 2025. And the, the base, the tax base is on realized gain, not unrealized. In some jurisdictions, you have it on both realized and unrealized, but in the case of Nigeria, it's purely unrealized. And the period is uh, 2023, from 1st January 2023 to 2025. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson Chuku. I guess uh, Professor Waleke has actually responded appropriately to that. <laughs> what I would only add is that um, the um, the law is retroactive, which is against uh, the tenets of taxation and tenets of law. Uh, it's retroactive in the sense that um, you want to impose tax because we also call what, what we call tax avoidance, eh? uh -huh. uh, which is different from tax evasion. Tax evasion is a criminal act, but tax avoidance, you can actually say there's a tax on frisky drinks. I don't drink Coke, I don't drink Fanta, so I'm not going to pay that, that tax. Uh, but it's not when I have drank it, you now impose a tax on me and say, look, that thing you drank last year, I have a choice to say I won't drink it. So if they uh, want to make law, we must make sure that tax laws and every other law are not retroactive, uh, retroactively applied. So 2023, as a year of assessment, is a retroactive uh, um, application of the tax law, and that should not be. It should be going forward. Uh, I think that uh, the government must take note of. So in terms of, uh, I think that's the key thing. What is the, and in terms of, uh, does it include um, um, unrealized, unrealized uh, profits? Uh, the, it, the law eventually excluded on your life's profit. But remember, there's also what you call, when you talk about your life, there's also to go in tax. And I'm sure today you are very familiar with this. You have what you call deferred asset and deferred liabilities. So, uh, and that's uh, asset that could reverse at the other timing difference. So, if you now impose a tax of this nature on profit made on movement of a variable that can actually move uh, the opposite direction, then yeah, you take that tax. Then it then means that when it reverses, you need to refund that tax. So in that case, if should that happen, what you have is you defer tax liability. So they, they, they shouldn't compel that tax body, I mean, that agent, uh, uh, that taxable uh, uh, organization to pay that tax because it could reverse, which also takes you to the issue that Central Bank had actually said earlier. Central Bank forbid, uh, had to forbid the banks from paying dividend from the capital, from the gain made from exchange gain, uh, or what we, what we now call the windfall, uh, earnings, principally because the central bank said it will reverse. So if the central bank had imposed an embargo or restriction from, on banks from paying uh, uh, any dividend, so automatically it don't follow that. 
you cannot impose that tax on the only allies portion of that um, um, uh, it, it, it gain. And I think that must have informed the decision not to impose it on the only, to exclude the only allies portion of uh, any exchange gain. Uh, because mm -hmm. if you think it could reverse, if the bank thinks the HND could go back to 1,000 naira to a dollar or 800 naira to a dollar, then if you take that, you will have to, you shouldn't, they shouldn't pay it. It will only be what they call a uh, uh, deferred tax liability. Hmm. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Martin. please, I have information. Okay. Okay. Yes, the information oh. is. Um... Okay, I think we'll get back to Prof when he joins us. Um, so, Here's another question, and this so is in line with um okay, prof. Yeah, uh, global practice. Um, the, the retroactive nature, as I said, is in line with global practice. And remember, I also, also said that it's actually a tax on on end on end reward. Okay, mm. so I think that point, uh, you know, uh, should be noted. If you look at the banks now, somebody, I uh, think one of the discussants mentioned it, the banks are still declaring. Um, you know, profits even despite that the banking sector, the last GDP reports, the banking sector grew by 29%, uh, while manufacturing uh, 1.28, uh, agriculture 1.41. So you can see that these some other sectors were adversely affected, while the financial services sector, a uh, number of banks made their gains. So globally, that's what happens. A means to redistribute wealth, not necessarily uh, as a source of government revenue. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this question is to Dr. Tilewa. Um, I will direct this one to Dr. Tilewa. It's, for, it's an anonymous person, but I would ask Dr. Tilewa this question. So far, I can understand windfall taxes levy being collected from uh, profits made due to act of God, even after abiding all the code of conduct and policies. What I want to know now is, will the government compensate if the same conditions makes a firm in cure losses. All right. Thank you very much for that question. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Um, interesting. So the question was raised that um, if you take a look at the banks, um, I think let's take a look at the scenario with the banks. Uh, the banks are growing at 28%. Uh, there was an analysis we did recently on the year end. And the banks are growing at 28% per GDP growth the oil and gas, which grew 10% after coming back, and all the other key sectors, value added, agriculture, manufacturing, telecoms, are achieving very anemic growth, under 5%. In fact, manufacturing 1.8, and all the other sectors are growing in a very weak area. So the question is that we need to, it's it's not it's not so much about compensation, but creating a stable, stable macroeconomic environment. When you create a stable macroeconomic environment, everybody thrives. Mm. I, there was a time in Nigeria where this economy was growing between 8.5 to 12, 13%. If you take a look at 20, 2011, 2013, 14, inflation was less than about 11% and NPR was about 12, 13%. At that point in time, the Nigerian economy grew by 8 to 12, 14%. Nobody was talking about a windfall tax at that point in time because everybody was thriving, the banks were doing well, and everybody is doing well. It is when you have distortions in an economy that people complain. So when you have this distortion in an economy and the banks are growing at 28% GDP, they're declaring bumper profits, and everybody else is suffering, then what do you do? It is important that the manufacturing sectors should be given tax breaks. Because if you do not give them tax breaks and you are increasing VAT at a time when you are in stagflation and the economy is not growing and purchasing power is low, Nigeria has become a sachet economy. Even alcohol is sold in sachets. So that tells you that your purchasing power has been depleted significantly. 133 million people in multidimensional poverty Meanwhile, you are putting on a consumption tax. The consumption tax is going to affect consumption. It's going to affect consumers because those sachet prices are going to go up. That is not the way to restore economic growth or confidence. So 
the most important thing from my own perspective is that you must create a stable macroeconomic environment where you are growing Nigeria's economy by at least 8% to like 12 or 15%. When our economy is growing between 8 and 15% on a consistent basis, nobody will be talking about tax. Even if you increase the tax at that point in time, there's significant purchasing power to compensate uh, and the banks will not be complaining. So it is a situation where you have a distortion whereby the banks are making money, but everybody else is not. So you become a target. So amidst when people are not doing well and there's only one person doing well, that person will bear the burden. But again, the people who are not doing well, you look at your sector, you identify what you need to do. We talk about this fund being reinvested into social infrastructure, uh, looking at the social intervention fund, looking at creating things with the hospitals, creating things with uh, education. So the, the key, really, as far as I see it, is that we must 2014 as we did in 2011. That's, that will be the solution to the problem. Thank you, doctor. So let me get to you, Mr. Kaluaja. Um, Chibuke is asking, why is it called levy and not tax? What is the significant difference in this regard? Well, I, I had the proof when I mentioned that um, it's because of the incidence that is not um, assessed on ordinary profit. That's what I heard the prof say, uh, because that's why it was called, like the National Assembly called it a levy. Uh, I don't think the, the word matters, uh, really, tax or levy, honestly speaking. It's money leaving the system as an investor, that's cash that shall come to you as dividends. Uh, as, the, as a corporate Nigeria, that's money leaving the system to go to revenues to the government. Uh, going to get. So I, I think that's how the prof described it, that the National Assembly called it a levy uh, based on the incidents and the fact that it's not taxed on an ordinary income uh, that, that the banks were making, yeah. Mm. Uh, I will direct this question to Mr. Johnson Chiku just in a minute to explain further again, because Luca is asking, uh, what is the role of government on those who have uh, lost massively due to FX losses? Is it equitable to tax those who were in FX profits and leave those who have posted billions in losses from FX revaluations like Nestle, uh, Nigerian breweries, Dangote, Sugar, etc.? You know, um, in my earlier intervention, I actually mentioned that if you look at the balance sheet of the corporate Nigeria as a single consolidated balance sheet, you realize that whatever gain was made of the banks was offset by losses uh, by corporate, uh, by mostly manufacturing uh, companies. So um, what I would say is that if you look at the banks uh, in the first instance, of course, the government had no, not stated anything about how to support the manufacturing sector, those, particularly those who had suffered huge losses from this exchange rate movement. Uh, many of them are trying to come back to the bank um, to um, the capital market to raise additional capital, which is going to be a tough call. I remember when the MD of uh, PNG, Proton Gram, was leaving. Uh, one of the comments he made is that it's impossible to make consistent dollar uh, profit in Nigeria, and that was why they decided to go. So we may actually be um, uh, heading a lot of other manufacturing outfits to leave the country if we continue with taxes that are not conscious or policies that are not conscious of the implications of some of the sectors of the economy. But having said that, I also want to emphasize this. I think it's something that the government needs to also take into account. The banks, the profit the banks have made now will come back full cycle as losses uh, or um, risk asset default, coming from risk asset default or bad loan write off The simple reason that if a bank, a company have let money to us, a huge negative share of that funds, and it's not in a position in whatever way to pay back the loan they've granted to you. While you have uh, booked capital um, exchange gain today, you're going to write off those loans in the next three years because you start by first classifying them as substandard, uh, uh, Darfur, substandard, and then you go to a point where you have classified them as lost, and you have to take it by the bullet and write off those loans. So we must also bear in mind that the benefit that are accrued to the banks will also still be a cost to them when these loans become bad. Because clearly, you're going to see a major uptick in the number of money loans on the banks because a lot of the beneficial of those banks, their credit, their, their debtors are no longer in a position to pay back their loan because of the shift in exchange rate. There are several companies, including the unquoted companies, who have negative share of that fund because of the sharp movement in exchange rate. Uh, and those people may not be able to pay back the loans. We must 
also bear that in mind. And that's why I said earlier that if the central government, the federal government or primary objective was to maintain economic stability, and they said, look, you have gotten this windfall as a result of moving exchange rates to make sure that the economy is continue to operate effectively. What we need to do is to pass that benefit as tax uh, uh, holidays or um, some level of subsidy or tax credit to those who have suffered huge exchange losses. That way you will ensure that the manufacturing center continue to grow. I mean, one of my colleagues here has spoken about the growth in the private, in the manufacturing sector of the economy in the first, second quarter of this year and the growth as compared to the growth or uh, performance of the uh, financial services sector in the second quarter of this year. And that trend, remember that the manufacturing sector is the major employer of labor, is a sector that we also need to increase the value of our export. Because if we grow that sector, a point becomes a vibrant sector of the economy, maybe we'll be able to stabilize our exchange rate because they'll be able to export other countries. But what we're witnessing today is that we are driving away the manufacturing sector and we're going to continue to increase our imports. By P and G leaving, you're going to import everything they are producing. Um, Guinness has left. Yes, you can see it was another uh, company bought over them. Uh, um, GSP has left. You're going to import whatever they, they were producing now. So even when we have achieved some level of domestication and productive at, uh, production activity and manufacturing activity, we're losing it because of inconsistency in our policies that are driving away the risk sector of the economy. Thank you, Mr. Johnson Choko. Uh, I'm going. This question will go to uh, Mr. Professor Uche Waleke. Uh, it's from Adamu Zunu. Prof, you know that you've had an experience at the sub-national level in governance. So uh, the question is, how do we ensure that this windfall taxes do not end up being spent on recurrent expenditure, particularly salaries for civil servants? Yeah, thank you so much. A very good question. You see, that's the, I think, um, for me, it's more like the common string. Every member of the panel um, is um, happy on, happy on the fact that there needs to be transparency, accountability, um, you know, appropriate governance around the the funds or the the money the money to be raised. And one of the ways by which this can happen is by also involving the stakeholders, the banks themselves, in the management of the in the management of the fund. And ensuring that the proceeds, uh, again, I want to underscore that the proceeds are tied to specific projects that people can see. Um, that also helps, of course, in monitoring and also in the assessment of the uh, of the outcome. In some other countries, what we have uh, observed is that usually in many of them, except for Italy, uh, the the targets. In terms of what the government expects to get, you know, is usually lower than um, what actually comes in, um, and and that's most of the time speaks to you know the if, um, faulty implementation. That is why I had mentioned earlier that it's important for uh, the government to engage key, key stakeholders on the best way to um, determine. That's even the first point, the first step to determine what this windfall is. And um, also uh, put in place uh, mechanisms for the proper utilization of the windfall. Um, now, on the issue of um, it, it wasn't supposed to me, but let me quickly mention it that part of why it is seen more as le a levy is because it's uh, meant to be a one off um, uh, event. And now, the new uh, fiscal, national fiscal policy, which is what the committee is calling it, is. Um, uh, going to going to replace the national tax policy. The national fiscal policy is more comprehensive, of course, has um, uh, issues um, on spending and public debt as opposed to national tax policy that is purely off on tax. So the national fiscal policy defines tax as um, any imposition that, of course, includes um, levy, any imposition on the part of the government, a compulsory payment. So uh, as far as that fiscal policy is concerned, there is no distinction, no line of difference between a tax and a levy. Uh, they are the same. But with respect to this windfall um, uh, tax or uh, levy, the uh, choice of word, uh, you know, in my view, is levy in the sense that it is um, not meant to be recurring. It's meant to be something that is um, one-off. Thank you. Thank you, Prof.
Now, the next question uh, is anonymous. I will direct this to uh, Mr. Kaluaja. I know you mentioned something about a framework. So it's, it's asking, since we have seen in many events, uh, what happens if there is no further clear format to follow with regards to the impact on investors? I'm not really sure I get, get this question. Is he asking about the the framework for this whole windfall tax? Is that what he's going to do? What yeah, happens that, there's no... Yeah, that he's looking at, since we have seen uh, this in many events, what happens if there's no further clear format to follow with regards to its impact oh. on investors? I think you can take the investors, yeah. the impact on investors' perspective. Yeah, I mean, it, it's that uncertainty like we talked about earlier that is that has brought the prices of stocks down for banks. So even though you see the banks making profits, even in uh, in Q2, uh, their share prices have been muted because initially this uncertainty is what's dragging it down. So I would say keep investing according to your plan. The whole point is to buy a good company at a good price. And a good price is a price that is below earnings. So if you're buying below intrinsic value, Overall, you know, the stocks will basically make money for you, which is now the problem because if you cannot price in the 3.3 trillion, then it's difficult for you to determine intrinsic value. But I would just say overall, stay within your objective. Why are you investing? Uh, buy a good bank at a good price. Buy a good stock at a good price. It's always good advice anywhere uh, you, you can. And you know, factor in that risk. It might bring down your dividends a bit, but where else are you going to invest? Like we've, we've heard them say, you know, if the banks are making money, that means that you should get a good dividend at the end of the day. You're an investor. That's basically what you are in the market for, to make money. So focus on where the money is going to. That's that's, that's what they say. Uh, overall, I'll just make this, this point. Uh, targeting the banks is, I think, is because they're an easy mark. You know, like someone has asked, how do we target or how do we bring in this fund? Other guys made a lot of profit. I know an insurance company, that made unrealized profits on FX as well. Insurance companies are not being targeted as well. Other unlisted companies also made profits. They are not being targeted. So the banks are out there. They are big. They are bold. So it's easy to target them. But let's remember that if we want to get investors in, then these are also what they're going to factor in and write down as the risk to, of investing in Nigeria. So that's my take. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and then to... Yeah, uh, please, let, let me quickly add... Let me quickly okay. add that um, any, anybody um, thinking of investing in bank stocks at this moment should um, be prepared to, uh, you know, do at least medium to long term. Um, I, I wouldn't expect any investor uh, to, especially if you're playing in the um, secondary markets, to, to think um, short. So... Um, such investors should be able to hold the stock for um, at least a minimum of um, two years until the end of the recapitalization exercise before we can begin to see uh, reasonable appreciation in share price. We have seen the, if you look at where some of these um, stocks are in terms of their 50 to 52 week high, uh, that, that will tell you that um, a number of them still, you know, uh, have these potentials, especially against their, you know, their strong fundamentals, which um, just as has been observed, should be what is you know should drive um, any investment um, in those uh, stocks. Thank you, Prof. Now I'll direct this question to uh, Dr. Tilewa, and the question is around the fact that all the guest position on the windfall tax administration has been raised, but what is the role the people can play here, the households, the Nigerians? to ensure that they can navigate this? The person says proper administration, but I think navigating this period. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, people, um, we always talk about the people, but uh, one of the challenges in Nigeria is that um, we, the people, tend to be very passive. Um, people just tend to take things at face value. And that is why, unfortunately, the democracy does not work. In any other situation, most people would have been writing to their congressmen, their parliamentarians, their House of Reps, their senators, protesting and making their positions known. Uh, where are the lobby groups that are representing people's interests? So that is where the democracy fails in Nigeria. Because in other clients, when people see these sort of things and they know a new law is going to be passed, they start to put pressure 
of the legislators. And the legislators are concerned about their elections. <laughs> that if we pass this thing, I might not be reelected. So when the thing becomes an election issue and the fact that people are watching you, it's only in this country you don't know the voting patterns of your of your senators or the voting patterns of your House of Representatives because it doesn't matter. So we, the people, are still very disorganized. We're, we're very passive, and people have not been able to mobilize their positions into lobby. Where are the lobby groups that you know are, are, are looking at this? Yes, the corporates are more organized, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, NASIMA, the Chamber of Commerce, the National Economic Summit groups, uh, the industry groups within uh, MAN and NASIMA. They're, so th it is these organizations that we do not have. So these organizations, where are their positions? You know, they should be coming out, you know, with counter proposals uh, to a lot of all these things that this is hurting us. This is where we need to be. You will see these organizations have their own economists who would come out to advocate their positions uh, in, uh, in a very active manner. But the hmm. people are, with 133 million Nigerians in multidimensional poverty, most people are trying to find, they're living on a day-to-day -day basis. They do not have any, their, their, their mission in life is survival. So all these hmm. issues you're talking about are, are irrelevant to them. Uh, they're looking at the next sachet of sugar they're going to buy, or even Gary now being sold in sachets. Uh, transportation costs are going to go up pretty soon. So people are basically dealing with survival issues that a lot of all these issues, uh, government normally has a free hand just to push them through. And before you know what's happening, the legislation has been uh, passed through. And that's the way it is. So this is really where we have a challenge. Uh, oh. Because, you know, and that is why forums like this, which we're having, uh, we need to be able to have this sort of forum, uh, record it as ProShare does, and let the relevant people in government harmonize our findings and let them know that this is what people are saying. We need to constantly and continue put the pressure back onto government through these sorts of intervention to understand that, you know, these things have deep impact on the population and on the people. And putting up increasing VAT to 10% with 133 million people in multidimensional poverty, suffering in a sachet economy and imposing a consumption tax on them with additional fuel price increases is a recipe for social unrest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Selewa. You've, you've really cleared it um, in the fact that we need more citizen engagement. Yes, we have stakeholder groups but we need to engage more. And of course, government has to be responsive in how it engages to get the views of the citizens. Thank you very much, Dr. Tilewa. Now I'll get to you, Mr. Johnson Chuku. And this question, I mean, talks around the markets too. It says, what should be government's disposition to sectors that make excess profits or losses, in bracket, from changes in economic conditions going forward? How do we capture unlisted companies that make excess profits from the same condition that triggered the current windfall tax? Okay, uh, what I would say in terms of capturing companies that are not listed is that today, uh, Federal Inland Revenue Service uh, generates the turnover of every company that is uh, taxable. Right? And then uh, when you submit your tax returns, they use your revenue that they generated from the, uh, the banks to determine whether your project, your um, revenue you're reported in your audited financial statement it mirrors what they can see from your transactions. And then if they are um, double counting or, or contract entries, you will now have to explain that and they will adjust it to give you their own expected uh, tax liability or to reconcile your own tax uh, self-assessment report with their own assessment of your tax liability. So there's still a window to assess companies based on their turnover and then there's also the minimum tax policy that even when you're not making uh, lost profits you will still have to pay some level of minimum tax so in effect if we improve if we could not improve our tax system uh, and then we automate most of our transaction uh, the uh, um, assessment process would the government or the federal revenue minister will still be able to reasonably uh, uh, levy appropriate tax on companies that have made uh, win for profit or excessive profit. Uh, ideally, our tax system should be such that 
we have a defined tax law. And then unless if you are talking of extraordinary facts that you have no contribution to, uh, and that's when you actually call up, call, talk of windfall tax. Sometimes what we are classifying as windfall tax are not things that we have no control over or are not fortuitous, as one of my colleagues have actually referred to it. Simple is that anybody who is savvy in financial management would know that you could take dollar position in Naira and Nigeria, knowing fully well that the exchange date that was doing there was not sustainable and something was going to give in. So it was a logical treasurer's uh, uh, bid that I would take a dollar position uh, instead of holding my assets in Naira, I hold my assets in dollar, uh, given that I know that the exchange rate doing at then at 400 or something Naira was artificial because the power market was doing about 720, 730 Naira. So you expected that the government, the incoming government, and we all knew that we're moving to an election period. A lot of us said, look, the three foreigners in that election are pro uh, 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 market oriented people that they, we so respected it and some adjustments in exchange rate. So if you take a, a, a bet, which could go wrong, assuming that uh, Nigeria has begun to produce 2.5 uh, million barriers or 3 million barriers as a result of the advent of the new government, and then not appreciated, then you could have taken a loss. So it wasn't exactly fortuitous. Uh, so windfall tax should actually be purely fortuitous. Nature, not where you take an economic decision that eventually turned out positive for you. That's what I would say. But in terms of uh, being able to levy and uh, charge appropriate tax on even on quoted companies, the Federal Revenue Service already have a reasonable access to the revenue of government uh, businesses, including on quoted businesses. And they also query because they expect you to give them your GL, your general ledger, which is a comprehensive list of your, um, your uh, entire transactions. And they will query things, expenses that they think are not allowable. And eventually, they will end up imposing or leaving appropriate tax to even opposing companies. So we just need to keep it, expanding the tax bracket uh, to include companies that they make sure that every company is uh, taxable and every company uh, records can actually be captured using the BVM, which is what they use currently. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chuku. Now, this question, uh, I would direct it to Dr. Adebajo. Uh, this is the last uh, question. Um, given the retroactive angle to this particular tax regime, uh, Chukuma asks, is there a possibility of the affected banks? I want to, uh, I want to take it that it's looking at the implication for banks and maybe the outlook going forward. So Dr. Adebajo can speak to that in uh, one minute. Thank you. I think, first of all, banks in Nigeria are unique placed in the sense that banks constantly and continue to make huge profits and because of the structure of our economy that will continue to be the case so i'm not really worried about banks to be honest with you and more importantly they're very well regulated and i think the regulators know how to regulate them the central bank has done a very good job on that and um, as long as they continue to declare all these profits they'll continue to be targets and let me say uh, that i don't have any problem that most of these banks are going to raise their capital. A lot of them have concluded their offers and they're already oversubscribed uh, because that is an area where investments will typically go to um, and um, those are safe bets. So I'm not worried. And banks also have to take responsibility for those profits that they're making. So I don't have any concerns about the banks in this country, to be honest with you. For me, it's not about the banks. Uh, the banks are prospering whether the economy is growing or not. My main concern is that we need to improve the overall economy of Nigeria. Let us go back to 2013. Let's go back to 2011, 2014, where Nigeria was growing between 8.5 and 13.5% uh, GDP growth. If you can achieve that and you can lower inflation to 11%, then you, you create value, really so the, the, the population we have of 133 million, instead of it becoming a liability, now becomes a population that is an asset and has purchasing power and can drive growth and can spend money to stimulate the economy. So my issue is not the banks. We need to get this economy back on track. That is my own uh, concern. If we do that, everybody will be okay. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a very interesting Q&A session. I mean, uh, this uh, conversation Ambassador, is- I have a, a minute? Uh, okay, you, just, just a minute, yes, bro. A minute? A minute, yeah. yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, it's just to react to the, the impression out there that the uh, uh, about the ten percent uh, VAT is largely okay. misrepresented, um, in the okay. sense that what the approach really is a whole of government approach. Yes, uh, we are looking at the entire tax taxes, uh, you know, which are currently in place. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure the chairman talked about the whole range of exemptions, uh, ensuring that small businesses are no longer going to pay tax. Uh, that wasn't mentioned. Um, uh, so it's, it's a whole, uh, it's, a, it's a package, okay? So to to analyze the, uh, or begin to talk about 10% would be to, sing, to single it out. You know, the danger of a single story is about a whole package that also involves other taxes. There is the uh, plan to even reduce going forward the company's income tax rate of 30%. So I think all that you know should also be in the um, front burner, uh, not just the VAT thing. Then on the issue of um, getting on listed companies or companies even maybe even in the for informal sector uh, uh, to be within the bracket of the windfall levy, I think that may not be uh, feasible or workable again because from global experiences. Windfall levies have been on large companies um, the, and large sectors like the energy sector, the banking sector, the electricity sector, the mining sector. Now, if you look at these sectors, electricity mining, you can't, they're not doing well, relatively in Nigeria. Um, it's maybe the oil and gas sector, uh, but the target of the banking sector is for a purpose, and that is because this is where windfall can easily be determined. Uh, can easily be captured. Um, again, that is what you find in other claims. Otherwise, the, it, the implementation may not be successful. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Like I said, it has been a very interesting conversation which elicited several comments and questions. And this is the beauty of a webinar like this. So we would like to get on to our last poll for the webinar. So I enjoy all our participants to engage. That's the last poll for the webinar. Thank you very much for participating in all our polls uh, for this webinar. And I'd like to get to our esteemed panelists to give their closing thoughts each in two, two minutes so that um, we'll wrap up this very interesting conversation. I will begin with Dr. Tilewa Adebajo. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, again, let me say thank you to ProShare for inviting me to this uh, economist conference. Highly honored. Uh, my wrap up is going to be very short because I think I've said it. Uh, my overriding concern is that we need to restore an enabling environment in the Nigerian economy. We need to bring down inflation to 11% and we begin to see consistent growth between 8 to 10% on a sustainable basis in Nigeria. That is the only way everybody is going to thrive in Nigeria. Uh, the government policy, as I've said, has been uh, the reform policy of this government has stalled. Uh, in fact, my latest uh, report says that this economy is now, the reforms are suffering fatigue and we're in a state of economic quagmire. Uh, the government has put the cart before the horse and it's time they press the reset button to ensure that we get back on the point of stability. And I think, as uh, Teslim has told us in the beginning, the trust deficits, I think, is a singular problem for this government. So um, very quickly, that's my own summation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tilewa Debajo, for your very insightful thoughts. Now to Professor Uche Waleke. Yeah, thank you. Uh, once again, I thank uh, you for inviting me to be part of this um, conversation. I also am also grateful to the my uh, colleagues, the discussants, um, is just to say that going forward, there is need for, you know, engagement, engagement with the stakeholders uh, to work out the best way to implement this, uh, such that at the end of the day, the social benefits, you know, outweigh the uh, the pains, you know, the pains by the bans. And I agree with uh, Dr. Tilewa uh, on the issue of uh, the need to fix the economy so that you know, every um, economic agent you know, will benefit. Thank you. 
Thank you, Prof. And uh, Mr. Johnson Chuku. Well, thank you, uh, Atabaz. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Shia, for this uh, very engaging uh, session. Uh, my concluding was that the government must evolve, the current government must evolve their economic development economic blueprint. That economic blueprint will define how they want to position the economy. Are we going to be a service-oriented economy? Are we going to be a manufacturing-oriented economy? How do we want to position the economy? And then we define those sectors that we want to make as priorities. And then we evolve fiscal framework, fiscal policies that will incentivize investment in those sectors. I think it's the big, biggest logic that we are, are implementing policies uh, as uh, on, on, on spontaneous basis or what you may call uh, based on the whims of the immediate situations on the ground. That's not how to deliver an economy. An economy must be a, a developed based on a well-defined growth path or growth plan. And that growth plan, every other policy would be a subset of the overall growth plan. And we must also recognize how each economic variable affects other variables. There is actually no silo when it comes to the actions of economic agents to economic policies. Uh, they will either, policies will either incentivize investment, consumption, or deter investment and consumption. And we shouldn't look at economic policies from a very narrow uh, frames. We must have a bare view of every policy we're involving and ask ourselves, will this further the overall economic development plan of the country? I think we must have that to, for, for us to grow this economy. That's how Singapore grew. That's how Malaysia grew. That is what happened in Vietnam today. That's what happened in China. That's what happened in India. So we can't just run the economy on as a spirit led, lead, lead uh, which is basically what will happen. We just see any, any a single item and hold on to it. And then we we'll think that singular item will lead to an economic, uh, a prosperous economic environment. Thank you, Mr. Chuku. And of course, Mr. Kaluaja. Yeah, I think, uh, thank, again, thanks uh, for the invitation. Uh, learned a lot. And I know folks that have learned also learned a lot. Um, I would just say we need to move with speed. And we need to broaden the conversation uh, in Nigeria. It seems to be that the government, again, is focused on one side of the balance sheet, i.e. raising revenues. The people of Nigeria have really not seen those benefits that were promised. Well, Nigeria has got four budgets running right now, as we speak. And we've done numerous interventions uh, from the when we had subsidy has gone to today. Numerous interventions which boil down to sharing rice and giving cash to state governors. It hasn't worked. Inflation is still up. Purchasing power is still down. The minimum wage has still not been paid. The economic plan that was called accelerated, we just had the board inaugurated a few weeks ago, months after the plan was launched. So there is no speed. There seems to be no direction. And people are not seeing any light at the end of that tunnel. The government has got to move with purpose and with speed. That's just what needs to happen. This conference emphasizes that point. Windfall tax, if you break it down in Nigerian palace, I see money, I want to take the money. But what are you going to do with that money? We're not sure, they're clear on it. So the government's going to move with speed and address the social issues. Big, broad plans, not this minute um, want to do buses, want to share rice. There's a big problem in the country. And if you don't address it now, it might boil over and the economy will basically stagnate. But we're being positive. There's an economy that's still attracting FPIs in. We still have a young population that is English speaking and educated and is still doing good things. So we have a lot of positives there. So let's harp on the positives and hope this economy with good guidance can revert back to the high growth that we had before. On that note, thank you. Thank you very much to our esteemed panelists. It's, it's very clear from a robust conversation for almost two hours now that is a need for a reset in terms of reforms. Uh, that fatigue is felt and there's need for a reset in terms of the reforms. There's also a need for continuous engagement and buy-in of stakeholders in uh, measures like this. It has to have the buy-in, a win-win situation. It's very important. We also look at the issue of a whole, up, whole of government approach in terms of policy, understanding the end game and how this will unlock opportunities. And of course, uh, one of the panelists has 
highlighted some economies and how they've been able to do this deepen the economy. We've also seen the need for speed, for purpose, and a whole linkage, which is very important for the growth of our economy. So I want to thank our panelists today for taking our time to be part of this conversation. I want to thank you, Dr. Tilewa Debajo, CEO, CFG Advisory. Thank you for being part of this conversation. I also thank want you. to thank Professor Uche Waleke, who is the Director of the of Capital Market Studies, National State University, and also serves in the Presidential uh, Tax and Fiscal Policy Committee. A lot has been sent to you, and I believe you would uh, refer back to your committee members, a lot of expectations from your committee. Also, uh, we thank Mr. Johnson Chuku, the Group CEO of Kauri Asset Management Limited for this very, very insightful contributions you made today. And Mr. Kalu Ajay, the financial analyst who always gives us nuggets and insights that we must learn from. Thank you all for being part of uh, this conversation. We want to thank you very much for all your thoughts today. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It has been a very insightful conversation about Nigeria's windfall tax and how we can move beyond concerns to governance. I want to thank our esteemed panelists who made this conversation robust and impactful. To all our participants who took our time to be part of this uh, session, we thank you. And of course, schedule to join the conversation. We thank you all. You can log on to our website, www.proshare.co to get further updates on this. And of course, our web TV on YouTube platform. Thank you for being a part of this webinar and enjoy the rest of your day.